Okay, so my plan for today is to go over the exam. We'll see how far we get. Um, does anybody have any questions before we start? Yes? When will we get our grades back? I don't know when you'll get your grades back. So, well, so here's how it works. We grade them. They're not quite done, but they're almost done. I left at 11.30 Friday night grading this stuff. Like there are, it's a lot of people in the class and these things are really difficult to grade and there's uh, a lot of partial credit. So it takes a really long time. Um, we will finish it today. Then we're going to send it to the um, service that scans it. And that will, they, it will be sent there today. And then after it goes there, I have no control over what happens to it. It takes them however long it takes. And I know the next question you're going to ask is, will I at least give you the scores? No. Because here's what happens then. I give you your score, and you find out that you got 98%. And then you email me and say, why did I miss two points? And I don't know, because I don't have your exam. So um, you know, it just, we just have to wait for them to be scanned, and, and it takes however long it takes. Overall, my impression from, you know, from grading it is that you know, there were some things that most people really got, and there were some things that you know, maybe not so much. But you know, overall, it seems pretty reasonable given that it was a very long exam. So anyway, let's talk about it. Any more questions before we do that? Can we enlarge it a little? I'm sorry, what? Can we enlarge the image? OK. Um, I don't know how to do that. All right, anyone who knows how to use this thing is welcome to come and try. There are some extremely cryptic menu options. Hmm. Maybe this coming down? Does that work? Does that work? Yeah, it does. Ah. Well done, sir. OK. So now the other thing is, so now that this is enlarged, it's going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to have to move this around to keep it on the screen. And I can't see it. So please tell me if it's, uh, if it's not visible. OK. So we start with the short answer questions. These are pretty straightforward. Um, assign this molecule to a point group, BOH3. And the assumption that it's really cold is important because that means that you have to draw this thing. And assume that everything is rigid. And so that means that your point group is C3H. And I know that this exact example was done in discussion, so go to discussion. It's important. OK, so the next one. What's the maximum degeneracy of orbitals for a molecule in the S10 point group? How do you do this? Anybody know? Yes? That's right. That's all you do. So you look on the character table, which um, we have one here. And this particular character table doesn't have the S10 point group, which is why I had to uh, put it up for you. But let's do it for S8. So here it is. So you go to the character table. And you look at your symmetry species here. We've got A's and B's and E's, but no T's or anything else. And we know that symmetry species that are called E something are doubly degenerate. 
So the highest degeneracy for that one is two. So really straightforward if you know how to do it and otherwise not. All right, so next one. What symmetry species does an S orbital belong in the D infinity H point group? So this is another one where you just go look at the character table. So we've got the D infinity H point group. And if you look it up on the character table, what you see is, you know, as we know, an S orbital is spherical. And so it's going to be invariant to any transformation. And so it should just have ones for everything under that uh, symmetry species. And so if we look at the top one here, we have one, 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 one. It's invariant to every transformation. And here it's called sigma G plus. So we've seen those being called, you know, A1, A1, you know, prime, thing, or, or A, AG, things like that. In this case, it's called sigma G plus. And again, that uh, you just get that from looking at the at the character table. And you know, I gave you a point group where you haven't you haven't looked at it much probably, and it has a bunch of crazy stuff that you don't recognize. But it doesn't matter. All you need to look for is what's the symmetry species that's invariant to every transformation. Okay. And on um, version B, there was C infinity V. So similarly, you just check out the character table, and here it's A1 or a sigma plus. And so either one of those was accepted because they're equivalent. OK, so the last one of these was just uh, testing your ability to use direct notation. and. The question is, we want to write an expression for the probability that's in, that a system in some state with nu equals 0 and j equals 1 will later be in the state nu equals 1, j equals 0. And so all you need to do is put this in direct notation. And that's it. We accepted various uh, variants of that, like if you put nu equals 1, j equals 0 in the, uh, in the brackets, that was also fine. So there were, there were sort of trivial variations of that that we accepted, but that's how you do it. Question? Okay, question. Why do we not include the dipole operator in there? Because we didn't say that those two states were connected by the dipole operator. So this is just a, this is just a projection. And if, if we were talking about a particular type of spectroscopy, then we might say that they're connected by the dipole operator or they're connected by you know, some other operator. But here that wasn't specified, so that's just not, that's not part of the problem. So this is, this is really general. And what you're talking about would be for the particular case of, of uh, vibrational spectroscopy. I see where you're coming from because that's a reasonable thing to, to do with it. But you know, we, didn't, uh, we didn't specify that. All right. So now we get to matrix representations. So. You were given some information here about the molecule. Um, you're told that it's square planar, so you know what shape it is. And your basis is the PZ orbitals on all the F atoms. And notice it's not a linear combination of them, so we're talking about the individual PZ orbitals and not that molecular orbital. And so the first stage is to just draw this molecule. And 
home, draw your PZ orbitals. And we said they're all in phase with each other. So you didn't really have to draw this to, to get credit as long as the answer was right, but it was uh, certainly easier to, to see what you did if so. And we could label them. And then we need to look at what happens when we do different things to the, uh, the molecule. Okay, so for sigma V, we start out with our vector being this. And we end up with So I am taking this through an axis that's cutting through one and three. That's the vertical plane that I'm using. There were a whole bunch of different ways to do this, depending on where you put your vertical plane. And uh, John Mark sat there forever working out every possible way to do it. So you know, we did give you credit for various ways that you could set it up. We actually gave people credit for doing it with the dihedral planes as well, just because it's kind of hard to visualize, so, you know, good enough. It was, the idea was, you know, do you know how to do it? And we didn't, we didn't really penalize for, for that. Okay, so in order to do this, we have two and four switching places and nothing changes sign. So if you do it like this, we get one stays the same, two ends up where four was, three stays the same, and four ends up where two was. And that's the matrix you need to do that. So again, you could go the other way, and that's equally correct. If you went in between, like this axis, that's actually the dihedral plane, but we gave you credit for it anyway if you put that down. Okay, so the next one is C2. <coughs> and I prefer to set this up on um, so that your C2 is the same as the principal axis. Of course, there are two other C2 axes that are perpendicular to that, and we give you credit for them. So it, it wasn't, uh, you know, ideally you should set it up so that C2 is the one that coincides with your principal axis, and then the other two are C2 prime and C2 double prime, but we didn't worry about it. We give you credit if you set up any reasonable C2 operation. All right, so. If, um, if you set it up on your principal axis, you get something like this. So one and three swap places. <coughs> Is that right? Yes, okay. And again, there are different ways to do it, depending on how you defined your C2 axis. You could define it perpendicular to your principal axis and flip it over you know, this way or this way in the plane. That was also fine. Okay, so then the last one is to just find the, um, the characters for these matrices that we found. And of course, you do that by just adding up the diagonal. So for that one, it's one. Oh, it's two, you're right. Can't read my own handwriting. And that one is zero. This one is two on the key. I just, I just looked, glanced at it too quickly. Okay, so that's how you set up the matrix representations. Um, everybody okay with that? Anyone have questions? All right, cool. For the most part, people did reasonably well with that. There were 
you know, once in a while there was somebody mistaking the operation, but mostly that went pretty well. Um, we should look at the other version too because there were different, uh, different operations given. Okay, so our basis is the same, but we also did the inversion. So if we do an inversion, then one in three swap places and two in four swap places. Oops. So one in three swap, two and four swap. So that's the inversion. And nothing changes sign here. We're just we're just flipping the uh, we're just inverting the positions of the, the objects. <coughs> this is version A. Yeah, I was just thinking about that and I realized uh, the signs do change. And again, again, John Mark got it right on the key. It's just, uh, it's, it's hard doing it up in front of everybody and it takes me a minute to, to think about it. Okay, so yeah, you're right. The signs do change and we did get that, that right. So you understand why, right? Like you take the, the coordinates of each position and X goes to minus X for each one, Y goes to minus Y, Z goes to minus Z. So they do change sign. Okay, so now we did a C4 rotation. And if you do it counterclockwise, you get you get this. and your character for that equals zero. Of course, you could also do it clockwise and we counted that too. If you do, if you do it clockwise, you just get this matrix reflected about the diagonal. It's the same thing. Yes? If you have it in the same phase and it inverts, does it still go negative if all the lobes um, are in the same phase? It does, yeah, because Yeah, it does. And all of them are negative, right? Yeah, it just, it ends, you end up with, uh, with, with all of them being negative. Actually, I have to think about that for a second. Okay, so if we invert it and they're all the same phase, then, yeah, we end up with the same thing and they're all negative. Okay, so now let's move on to the, um, the matrix representation or the, uh, the group theory applications. Okay, so these were Oops. Okay, so the group theory representations, this is where we set up a basis for our problems and learn about uh, bonding and uh, the IR and Raman active modes from the symmetry. And so the first part is that, so this, this thing where it says, draw the Lewis structure and double check it and what is the hybridization of the central atom. 
that's just a hint for you to make sure that you draw the thing right and, and get it uh, in the right point group. OK, so what we end up with is we have We have this thing. So on the other one, the um, on the other one, the molecule was was chlorine pentafluoride, which some people didn't read the name and interpreted it as CIF5. You're lucky people because you get it in the same point group if you do that. So it it turned out basically okay. Um, so we, we counted that, but you know, again, it's important to read the whole thing carefully. Like it, it is, you know, it is easy to misinterpret that. So that's why I also wrote out the name. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a real molecule. It does really exist. Here's our principal axis. And the reason I wanted you to, to draw the Lewis structure and look at it is first of all, you have to count electrons to know that you get that lone pair on the chlorine and that tells you the shape of the molecule. And also, um, we want to know the hybridization of the central atom because that's going to help us check, check our answers. And so that's the hybridization, right? Because we have, uh, you know, we've got the, we have six orbitals in play on the bromine. <clears throat> and so we have the S and the three Ps and two Ds. And this is, you know, just from general chemistry knowledge. Okay, so now does that mean that all the orbitals there are involved in the bonding? No, right? Because one of them is taken up by a lone pair. So the answer that we expect to get should involve an S orbital and three Ps and a D, but the extra D is taken up by the lone pair, so that's not gonna be involved in the bond. Okay, so having uh, set this up and drawn the molecule, we find that it's in the point group C4V And so um, if you got it in the wrong point group, the rest of this is really, really hard because bad things happen and it doesn't work out right and you get fractions and things like that. But so here's what we get for our reducible representation. Okay, so. If we look at this and use the shortcut for figuring out uh, you know, what the characters are for this molecule, our basis is the five bonds, since that's what we're asking about. That's what we want to know. And so for the identity, we get five. If we do a C4 rotation, so that's like I'm holding that top fluorine and rotating it 90 degrees. The top one changes, or the, sorry, the top one stays the same and all the rest of them swap. So that's one. If I do a C2, the same thing happens. The one, the one along the principal axis doesn't change and the rest of them swap. And so now here's the hard part. Figuring out what is sigma V and what is sigma D. So these are all vertical planes, but meaning they contain the principal axis. But the definition of a dihedral plane is that it is oriented perpendicular to some C2 axes. And so that means that the vertical plane is the one that cuts through three of these, three of the fluorines, and the dihedral one is the one that goes in between. Because it goes in, what's that? Sure. So we're, we're assuming that our C2 axis coincides with the C4 axis, the, the principal axis, right? And it, and it has to in this case because there's no other C2 axis there. I mean, there's two of them, but they're, they're both you know, oriented that way. And then um, the vertical plane you know, goes along that, and the, the, but the definition of a dihedral plane is that it's per, it, it bisects two perpendicular C2 axes. So that's why it goes between the, uh, the atoms. And so, what's that? 
No, you don't. You have two. Because because you can go this way or this way. So so I'm saying that my so my uh, my si sigma v goes through these four atoms, and sigma d cuts between the fluorines. So like if I like if I call this x and that y, I can rotate 180 degrees about x or y, or right, and it, and it works. And then the dihedral plane cuts between them. So that said, if you got these backwards, so if you put one here and three there, you get something that works out pretty well, and you just get a different d orbital involved in the bonding. And I think we took off two points if you did that. You got, you got almost all the points for, for doing that. It's an easy mistake to make. They're hard to visualize. And you wouldn't know you had done it because you get an answer that looks completely reasonable. So that was a very, very minor issue points-wise. OK, so, so now that we've gotten this far, we need to reduce our representation and learn what happens to the bonding. OK, so. We are going through the, um, the various symmetry species from the character table. And so here we get OK, so I get two A1s. And does everybody remember how I'm getting this? I went through it fast. Yeah, OK. So I got two A1s. And then for A2, I am not going to work it out, but I got 0. B1 is 1. B2 equals 0. And E equals 1. OK, so that's the reducible representation. Yes? Can we have a different basis for each uh, Can you have a different basis? Definitely not, because the whole question is, um, you know, we want to find out about the sigma bonds. And there's only one set of sigma bonds. Although maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. What, what, uh, what do you mean? I was thinking, like, if we choose, like, uh, <laughs> Well, so, but your, your basis is what you set up at the beginning that is, so we start with something that we know the symmetry of. That's what we want to, to find out about. And so you, you set up your basis in the directions of all of those sigma bonds. And you don't know which d orbital is going to be involved in that at the beginning, right? That's the question. Well, I think if you look at the character table, uh, by the point group, But so you're saying you look at the character table and then decide a priori before you set up the basis which orbitals are going to be involved? Um, it's not a good idea, right? Because it might work in some cases, but it might not work in other cases. So you really do need to work through the, the you know, reducing the representation to get your, your symmetry species. I'm not saying that that won't ever work. It's just that it won't always work. So it's, it's uh, dangerous to do. OK. So we have our reducible representation, and we reduced it. And so now the next step is to look at the character table and see which orbitals are involved in the bond. So this is really important, because I was surprised at, um, you know, I know it's, it's a time pressure situation. But a lot of people got this far and did everything exactly right and then put down nonsense for the orbitals, which is kind of sad. So, you know, it's, it's important to go over this because I want to make sure that you, that you really get it for the, the final. OK, so now it's time to take a deep breath and think about, you know, what does our answer mean and does it make any sense? OK, so if we look at the character table, we know that from our reducible representation that there have to be two orbitals involved that have A1 symmetry. And if we go and look at it, 
we see that for C4V, if we look at our character table, A1 has Z, but we know that there are supposed to be two orbitals there. Now, are there two Z orbitals on that central atom? No. So what's the other one? S, S that's right. You have, and you have to remember that an S orbital always belongs to the symmetry species that has ones for every operation. You know, it's invariant to all transformations. Okay, so this one gave us S and PZ. And so what I'm saying when, you know, when, I, when I've said that uh, people sort of did everything right and then came up with nonsense, some people put 2PZ instead of, instead of that. You know, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so A2, we don't have any, so you don't need to worry about it. B1, if we look at that, has nothing in this column, but it does have x squared minus y squared, and that is a perfectly acceptable d orbital. So this is dx squared minus y squared. Okay, and then I mentioned if you got these flipped around and worked it out that way, what you get instead is you get um, B2, which is DXY, and you know, again, you got most of the points if that's what happened. Question? Uh, for A1, how come you don't count the D orbitals? Because uh, there are D orbitals there. So by symmetry alone, there are D orbitals <coughs> there, but um, the reason you don't count them is that you know some chemistry. So you know that there has to be, you know, the, that the D orbitals are much higher in energy and there, there are only two A1s in that representation, right? And so we take them from lowest energy to highest energy. So we have an S and a PZ, and there aren't any more A1s there, and so you know that those, the S and the P orbital are going to participate in bonding before the D orbitals get involved just because you know some chemistry. Now, if we work this out and we got four A1 instead, then you would say S, P, and those D orbitals but we don't have enough of them to go around and use the d orbitals there. <clears throat> so those, I mean, those coefficients on the, the representations do correspond to the number of orbitals of that symmetry species that are involved in the bonding, and you have to take them from lowest energy to highest. And again, the character table and symmetry arguments on their own don't tell you that. You have to, you have to know. So it's really powerful. There are lots of things that you can learn from this kind of symmetry analysis but not everything. Some things you, you do have to remember. Okay, so what's next? So that's the dx squared minus y squared. And then for E, we had x and y. And so that's px and py. And so the actual answer is s, pz, px, py dx squared minus y squared. Those are the orbitals that are involved in the bonding. And so, again, there were variations of things that people did that involved getting all of this right and then putting down things that didn't make sense. So other things that people did included just writing down every single thing that is, uh, you know, that was listed under those symmetry species. Um, doesn't work, right? You have, to, you have to look at it and decide which orbitals are involved, also taking into account the energy considerations and not just the symmetry. Um, or another thing that I saw was people just leaving it as the symmetry species, but you can't do that either. That's not an orbital. You have to go through and look at the, the uh, character table and see what's actually involved in the bonding. Okay, so let's move on to the next part of the symmetry problems. And I want to point out for this thing, um, I made up the key for this part and I, I gave tons of partial credit. Like there are lots of things that, uh, you know, where it looked like you got some things but not others. There, there, were, there were lots of, uh, there was lots of partial credit given. Okay, so now, the question is, we've learned about the bonding, 
Now we want to talk about the vibrational modes of this molecule and whether they're IR or Raman active. And so the question is, what basis would you use for this? And what's its character? So for the basis, you just want to use an XYZ unit vector on each atom. And just writing that was completely acceptable. Some people drew it. That's fine. Um, I gave people partial credit for drawing it inappropriately on the previous page where you don't need to use it. Um, anything that indicates uh, that we're looking at uh, displacements of all of these atoms. So now what's the character for the identity matrix here? We have to put an x, y, and z coordinate system on each atom. There are six atoms, so the character is 18. Most people got that right. So if you got the, you know, if you figured out what the basis was, then you got this right. The people who fell down on this one forgot to put a coordinate system on the central atom. And that, that doesn't work because we're talking about the displacements of the whole thing, so you have to count all the atoms. Okay, so now the next part. Part of this was done for you just because the test is already long, and on the previous page, you already showed me that you know how to write reducible representations and use them to solve problems. So we don't need to do that again. So I gave you the answer to what you would get if you write this whole thing out and reduce it. And so some people asked me during the exam, hey, wait a minute, does this belong to the same molecule as the previous one? Because it's different symmetry species than the point group that I had it in. And that should be a clue that maybe something was not right with your point group, just you know, for future reference. OK, so, so this part was done for you. And the question here is, which symmetry species belong to translations, rotations, and vibrations? And so again, you have to go look at the character table, and we want to subtract the ones that belong to just translations and rotations, because those don't come into our IR and Raman spectra. And then whatever is left over is for vibrations. And so what we get is the translations in X and Y belong to E. And E is a degenerate representation, so X and Y both belong to it. It's not 2E, it's just 1. TZ was A1. Similarly, RX and RY are degenerate, and that's E. And RZ is A2. OK, so whatever is left is my vibrations. So I can write those down. So I have 3A1 and 2B1 and 3E. And again, if you did this basically right but got the coefficients wrong, you lost a couple points. But mostly it was OK. OK, so now the next question is, which ones are IR and Raman active? So again, we look at the character table and we say A1 has a component of the dipole moment and it has a component of the polarizability, so it's both. B1 does not have a component of the dipole moment, but it does have a component of the polarizability same thing for B2. And then if we look at E, it has a component of the uh, dipole moment and the polarizability, so it's both. Yep, here you go. So then the last part of the question, which you had to answer to get full credit, was how do you know? Um, look at the character table was not specific enough. Um, you needed to say something like, you know, mentioning the, the components of the polarizability or the dipole moment or people who just wrote X, Y, or Z next to the ones that are IR active and X, Y, or whatever next to the ones that are Raman active. 
got all the points. Basically, anything that let me know that you saw you know, where to look on the character table to get the, the answer got full credit. Just you know, look at the character table wasn't quite specific enough. OK, so now let's move on to the last one. We're going to run out of time, but that's all right. We're almost there. OK, so part A, the question is explain in words how the principle of IR spectroscopy differs from vibrational Raman spectroscopy. All I wanted here is that in IR, it absorbs a photon, and in Raman, the photon is scattered. So, so that's it. Like any, any variation of that, um, you know, w was taken. You know, beauty in writing it down was not really counted. I know everybody's in a hurry. So it was not, the explanation didn't need to be particularly profound. Anything that, that had absorption versus scattering was good. Okay, so now in the next problem, we're looking at uh, the spectra that you would see if we measured IR spectra. Yes, question. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. That's the main difference between them, right? The vibration level, the change in dipole versus the polarization. That's that's true, but it's not the that's the gross selection. It's not the physical principle of how the the spectroscopy operates. Okay. So you give yeah. credit for that? I don't remember. I think we gave some partial credit for it because it's true. It just doesn't it just doesn't answer the question. So I mean, that's you know that's the selection rule, and. Uh, you know, it, it, it is correct. It's just that what I was asking about is the, fin the physical principle as to how the, the photon is interacting with the, the molecule. But yeah, I'm pretty sure we gave some partial credit for that because it is true. But um, that, you know, that was answered sort of many other places on the exam. Okay, so now the next question. We want to sketch the spectra that are involved in uh, the IR spectra of HCl and Cl2. So again, these sketches, I wasn't looking for artistic merit here. Just if you got it basically the idea. Here's what, here's what I was looking for. So. You want to label your axis. Um, so intensity, arbitrary units, basically anything. The x-axis could be wave numbers, hertz, could be in units of B, could be in lambda. You know, it could be basically any of those things as long as you did it consistently and labeled it. And then for the spectrum of Cl2 and the IR, I am done because Cl2 doesn't have a dipole moment. So as pointed out, the selection rules are such that you have to have a dipole moment for the molecule to get an IR spectrum out of it. So Cl2 doesn't have one. Yes? Um, the question is, if, if you didn't draw it and you just said it doesn't have a spectrum, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. OK. Now, HCl. So again, what I was looking for, you know, the axes should be labeled the same way. And I wanted some kind of reasonable distribution of the heights of the peaks. You know, like they're not all the same height. And the spacing is 2B here and 4B here, and that is all I wanted. So what I was looking for is, is some understanding that the populations are, are different between the, the different states, as in the uh, lowest energy one is not the most populated. We haven't talked about that a great amount yet, but we have 
kind of mentioned it, and we've looked at a bunch of these spectra. Um, ideally, labeling the, uh, the spacings here and you know, basically explaining the reason why you don't get a spectrum for HCL. Okay, we are about out of time, but I think that's okay because the last one is straightforward anyway. You just have to plug stuff in and calculate. Next time, we're gonna start talking about electronic spectroscopy. See you later.